Now that we've got our feet wet implementing a dumb but simple algorithm for finding a separating hyperplane, I'll do my best to explain the canonical algorithm. The algorithm itself is pretty simple, but not obvious. And even when you see it, it's not obvious it should work. The first thing we're going to do is tweak our definition of a perceptron. Since it's somewhat inconvenient to maintain a vector of weights and an offset, let's see if we can, in a sense, get rid of the offset. Recognize that w dot x plus b is the same thing as the vector w with b appended to the end of it, dotted with the vector x with 1 appended to the end of it. So if we tack on a column of 1s at the end of our feature matrix x, and we tack on b to our weight vector w, we can redefine our perceptron as f of x equals the piecewise function, where we predict 1 if w dot x is greater than 0, and 0 otherwise. Now our separating hyperplane is defined entirely in terms of our weight vector, w. What comes with this is a really interesting geometric interpretation. Let's picture a really simple dataset with two samples in one dimension, a red dot and a green dot on the x1 axis like this. A separating hyperplane in 1D is just a point that exists somewhere in this gap. Now, when we modify x, tacking on a column of 1s, we're increasing the dimensionality of x. So points on this line suddenly become points in this 2D plane. Of course, they all have x2 equals 1, so they still lie on a 1D line, but now they exist in 2D. So what are all the hyperplanes that could separate this data? Well, there's this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and so on. So you might actually think we just made the problem harder, because now there's all these additional lines in 2D that we have to consider in our search. But wait, we got rid of our offset B. What that means is that we only have to consider lines that go through the origin. So we don't have to worry about this guy, or this guy, or this guy. I'll convince you that's true in a second. But let's go back to one dimension. Pick any point on this line. I'll pick a few of them, actually. Now, imagine this data rising up into two dimensions. It's visually clear that for any point we could have picked on this line, we can find an equivalent line in 2D that goes through the origin. So increasing the dimensionality of the data like this isn't going to be more restrictive than just searching for a separating point in 1D. OK, so how do I convince you that we're searching for a separating line that necessarily goes through the origin? You may recall the dot product has two very different but equivalent formulas. The first is that given a vector a and a vector b, a dot b is the sum of the product of their corresponding elements. This is the definition we've been using. The second is that a dot b equals the length of a times the length of b times cosine of the angle between them. The equivalence of these two definitions isn't totally obvious, but there's some good proofs of this online, so I'll leave it to you to look those up on your own time. Looking at this definition, how could it be possible that a dot b equals zero? Well, either one or both of the vectors has length zero, or cosine of the angle between them is zero which means the angle between them must be 90 or 270 degrees. In other words, they must be perpendicular. So, thinking about w dot x equals zero, if you imagine the weight vector pointing out into space somewhere, then the set of vectors x such that w dot x equals zero is the set of all vectors perpendicular to w. For example, in 2D, if our weight vector looks like this, then the corresponding hyperplane it defines looks like this. In 3D, if our weight vector looks like this, then the hyperplane it defines looks like this. All right, so let's say we have a data set like this, and then we randomly pick a weight vector like this, which means our hyperplane looks like this. By the way, which side of the hyperplane is the positive side? Meaning, for which side are we predicting positive 1? Well, remember w dot x equals the length of w times the length of x times cosine of the angle between them. 
So draw a vector on this side of the hyperplane. The angle between W and V is less than 90 degrees, so cosine of that angle is positive, which means the dot product is also positive. So when you see this picture, it's easy to remember. The vector W points in the direction of positive predictions. Okay, so we have this weight vector, which defines this hyperplane, which predicts positive for both of these samples, which means this red dot is misclassified. So how do we improve the decision boundary? Well, we can't shift it because it has to go through the origin, so we want to rotate it a little bit counterclockwise. And we want that update to be dictated by this misclassified point. So what we can do is, if you imagine the vector pointing to this red dot, if we subtract that vector from W, the decision line rotates in the direction we want it to go. All right, clearly we overshot. Nonetheless, let's just keep going with this idea. So in this case, we predict zero for both samples, which means this positive sample is misclassified. So this time, let's add this vector to our weight vector. And voila, we have a separating line for the data. This process is essentially the learning algorithm for a perceptron. More formally, the algorithm goes like this. Initialize w equal to the zero vector, that is a vector of all zeros. While at least one x is misclassified by w, pick an arbitrary misclassified x and update w to be w minus x if x is a negative sample, or w plus x if x is a positive sample. Keep in mind that if x lies on the hyperplane defined by w, we always call it misclassified. This is a fascinating algorithm, because at least to me, it's not obvious that the algorithm necessarily converges onto a separating hyperplane, assuming one exists. But it does, and it does it in a finite number of steps. Looking back at this example, it seems totally plausible that there may be a separable data set where the hyperplane just bounces around forever as we make updates. But to the contrary, if the data is separable, this thing converges. So for your next challenge, see if you can implement the code for this algorithm by refactoring the code for the perceptron class from the last section. Here's the implementation I came up with. Firstly, note that I adjusted the init and predict methods to assume the offset b is embedded in the weight vector w. Inside the fit method, I define x1 as x with a column of 1s inserted at the end. I use a while loop with two indexers, i and j. i iterates over the rows in x, searching for a misclassified sample, and j keeps track of the total number of iterations. y hat i is the label assigned to xi by the current hyperplane. If y hat i doesn't equal the true label for the ith sample, then I update w as either w plus xi or w minus xi, depending on whether the true label is positive. And as soon as I make a weight update, I reset i back to zero so the program goes back to the beginning of x, searching for a misclassified point using the updated weight vector. Once the program scans every element of x without finding a misclassified point, it updates the class attributes y classes and w. Alternatively, if max iters is reached, the program throws an error. Let's test it out on our known separable 2D dataset, just like we did in the last section. Empirically, this thing seems to work, but it almost feels like we're just using a heuristic and maybe there's a scenario where this algorithm fails to converge on a hyperplane that we know exists. By the way, if there's no hyperplane that separates the data, the algorithm just loops forever, or at least the canonical version does. After all, the algorithm's stopping condition is literally that the current hyperplane separates the data. So, assuming the data is linearly separable, how do we know for sure that this thing converges? It turns out there's a fairly elegant, but not exactly simple convergence proof.
I debated explaining this proof in this lecture, but honestly, it's kind of hard to explain in a way that's quick and interesting. So I'm going to take the cheap way out and refer you to this really nice write up by. Okay, here we go. Shivaram Kalyanakrishnan. All right, now let's see if we can apply our perceptron model to the MNIST dataset. Since the MNIST dataset has 10 target classes, and perceptrons are mere binary classifiers, we have to conjure up a simple binary classification problem. So instead of predicting which digit each image represents, let's just see if we can predict whether each image is a zero or not a zero. Hopefully this thing converges. Crap, it didn't converge. What does that tell us? Unfortunately, not much. I mean, it's an indicator that the data is not linearly separable, but it's possible that we just didn't run enough iterations. This resurfaces a nagging question. Given a set of data with two target classes, how do you know if it's linearly separable? Is there a simple test that can tell us, yes, the data is linearly separable, or no, it's not? It turns out, yes, there is a conclusive test to determine whether a dataset is linearly separable. The answer is linear programming. Briefly, for the uninitiated, a linear program is an optimization problem that can be expressed as maximize C transpose X subject to AX is less than or equal to B and x is greater than or equal to zero, where c is a fixed vector, a is a fixed matrix, b is a fixed vector, and x is the vector that the program tries to optimize. Lots of optimization problems can be restructured as a linear program. Restructure a problem like this, and then you can plug it into a linear program solver, LP solver for short. Magic happens, and you get back a solution. If you've ever heard of the simplex algorithm, that's a famous solution to a linear program, but it's been improved upon many times since its creation in 1947. Once again, there's some tedious math to explain how this works, so I'll spare you the details, but this article by Raphael Vogler helped me understand them. I even ended up rolling my own is linearly separable function that uses SciPy's linprog method to check if a dataset is linearly separable. And as it turns out, when you look at zeros versus non-zeros in the training portion of the MNIST dataset, they're not linearly separable. But if you take a random sample of 5,000 rows from the training dataset, zeros versus non-zeros usually is linearly separable. Which means even though zeros versus non-zeros aren't completely linearly separable, there's a hyperplane somewhere that does a pretty good job of mostly separating zeros and non-zeros. If we could find that hyperplane, we'd probably end up with a pretty good classifier. I should also mention that if the linear program solver converges, it necessarily has found a separating hyperplane. What's interesting about this is LP solvers like the simplex method existed before Frank Rosenblatt created his perceptron learning algorithm. So unless I'm mistaken, Frank could have just used an LP solver. 